So about a week and a half ago, I was moving back on campus, and when I had done so, around after I had finished packing and everything, getting everything out of the car, I had realized that I had left my backpack after my mom had left. And the frustrating thing about that is the fact that all of my equipment was in there, so I wasn't able to do any video work while I was waiting for her to come bring it back to me. So to kill time until she got there, which was around a few hours on my roommate's TV, because my phone was like a 20% battery, uh, <laughs> I had decided to rewatch The Bad Guys for the 50th time. And concurrently in the back of my mind, while I'm thinking, wow, the animation is very good, wow, there's so many underrated jokes, wow, we don't deserve Sharky, he's too good for all of y'all, it sent me down a rabbit hole where I also started thinking about, in the confines of the respective medium, animated wolves. I know upon hearing this being a topic of a video, some of you are thinking, ew, furry is gross, Yen said what's wrong with you. But I'm not really interested in looking at the romantic appeal of these characters, cause at the end of the day, taste is subjective. I am someone who always appreciates attention to detail when writing anthropomorphized animals though, because of how creative they can get with fleshing out a world that examines the humanity that can be found within animals. And today I'm going to be analyzing some observations and patterns that I've noticed about wolf characters in film and television that I've seen, particularly tropes utilized in a way that aligns with wolves' behavior in real life, because they are in fact very cool IRL. See, this was also a byproduct of me playing too much Animal Crossing because I, the happy home paradise extension, wolves kept showing up. And I spent these past few weeks or so making houses for them. My personal favorite is one I did with one of my koalas and Doby, and I did a little hospital for them. It's a really nice one, don't worry. And I would like to get some of them on my island at some point, but we've got a koala ethno state to build. We're halfway there. I can't stop the process just because of a full few <laughs> cool villagers, you know? All right, all right, all right. No more Animal Crossing tangents. It's time to talk about... The Canis lupus, aka wolves, are animals that hunt in packs, and when their role is more akin to their real-life counterparts, that's typically how they're depicted, even as limited background antagonists. Whenever you see a wolf chase in a film, it's never just one, and that's part of what makes them so effective as the apex predators in their respective biomes. I always think it's interesting when there are characters that operate in this setup while being anthropomorphized. The first example that comes to mind for me is Kung Fu Panda 2. By contrast to the brute strength of the villains that came before and after him, Lord Shen's two greatest assets to him in combat are his dragon cannons and an army of wolves. It isn't that he doesn't know how to fight, but not matching the standard set by other masters means that he can't rely solely on his own fighting techniques to achieve his endgame of conquering all of China. On his own, he can't stop everyone who retaliates, so he gets a bunch of furballs to do it for him. There's a much stronger emphasis placed on the psychological advantage he has over Poe, and what's treated as the most intimidating thing about him. At face value, the wolves seem to function as a standard set of disposable henchmen, with the one exception being the pack leader, Wolf Boss, who develops his own more personal rivalry with Poe that carries over until his first confrontation with Shen. I'll tell you what's gonna be yours. My fist and your plush cuddly, super soft face. They fought like a demon. Big and furry, soft and squishy, ugh, kind of plush and cuddly. There's one detail towards the end of the film with him that I think goes overlooked. Shen is willing to sacrifice the entire army once it looks like the good guys are getting the upper hand in the climax, and he forces Wolf Boss to fire the death cannon at Poe, even if it means that his entire pack dies. But he refuses without hesitation, and Shen kills him for his defiance. I don't read this as being a change in morality by any stretch of the imagination when you consider that these guys were perfectly fine with carrying out ethnic cleansing under Shen's rule. And with the mutual enthusiasm he has with Poe to beat the hell out of each other, yeah, there's no way this is about him. In fact, there's a lot to be said about his agency through this line after their final one-on-one -on -one fight with each other. I guess nobody told you, if you mess with a wolf, you get the fangs. 
One of the defining aspects of Wolf Boss's character is his loyalty. Part of why he's so obedient to Shen can tie back to being intimidated by him, but that no longer matters when the safety of his own is compromised. That's the significance of them being wolves. The bond between packs goes beyond mere survival. It's essentially one large family unit where everyone's compelled to look out for each other, which makes them more effective as hunters. He's the alpha male. He's the one that the others are dependent on as their leader. And I mean alpha male in its intended sense that being the terminology used for a wolf pack leader. These little details make arcs and plot beats that work in any format feel unique to this world. It's not always necessary, but you appreciate it when it's embedded in the writing. No army of henchmen or secondary set of antagonists is meant to outshine them in terms of threatening presence though, so if the anthropomorphized character within that army does get focused, they're usually meant to be a source of at least some laugh. Listen, I'm the alpha, I'm gonna eat this thing first. I'm gonna be the new alpha. No, there is... A less popular example of this is from Warner Animation Group's 2016 film Storks, where the Dutragonists come across a pack of ravenous wolves, the leaders being played by Key and Peele. Unlike Shen's wolf army, they're not attached to the main antagonist, or even the plot at large. But I do think it's interesting that, given their limited screen time, that realistic bond strength wolves have with each other is emphasized in the form of a running gag, where they use each other to form various transportation devices while chasing the heroes. They say this out loud each each time they do it too. It's always wolf pack, forma, wolf insert thing here. Wolf pack! Form of Wolf Bridge. I don't even think that this is meant to be a form of parody either. Rather, it's recognizing that there's a lot of humor to be found with wolves within that dynamic that talk, down to fighting over who gets to be alpha. <laughs> And this isn't to say that this is a formula that's only been done for wolves, but it's one that works very well for them, and is done frequently when they're portrayed as a group. Even the background wolves in Zootopia fall into this category, albeit in a way that can very much be categorized as parody. Gary, quit it! You're gonna start a howl! I didn't start it! <gasps> The social aspect of wolves is something that's generally given focus when shown in groups, but what about the ones that are on their own in their respective universes, aka the ones that everybody likes? The term lone wolf, which is used to describe someone who is independent and has a preference for solitude and isolation, originated from wolves that temporarily traveled separately from their packs. Although they still traveled long distances in an effort to hunt and find new territory, these wolves tended to be more aggressive as a survival strategy. Does that carry over to independent wolf characters in film and television. Dear God, I'm feeling such guilt right now. I, so much has happened recently. I Despite really getting into anime a lot these past two years, I haven't really talked about a lot of my favorite shows on this channel. And I only started watching this one recently, but Beastars... is on track to falling into that category. Seriously, I expected to be really uncomfortable with everything in this show, but it's super well written and that intro goes so hard from a visual and musical standpoint, and I'm so glad that I got into it just in time for what's looking to be the final season. My most anticipated thing coming out this year, aside from the wild robots. Being relatively early in the show does mean that I'm unaware of the directions they're heading towards in terms of character arcs, but the conflict that the show begins with comes from the tension present between carnivores and herbivores after an unknown predator eats one of the other students. And the show follows our wolf protagonist, Lagoshi, who's trying to unveil who the killer is. At the start of the show, Lagoshi primarily keeps to himself on account of him not fitting in with the other carnivores due to his passive nature. But there's a series of outside forces that enforce the idea that giving in to his instincts is what's best, leading to a lot of intense drama and existentialism with the herbivores that do come into his life like Haru. But Lagoshi's self-consciousness of how he's perceived by other makes the metaphorical definition of a lone wolf an inaccurate descriptor. He doesn't desire to be lonely. In the case of lone wolf being used to describe humans, it's meant to be voluntary. And with actual wolves, they aren't meant to be on their own forever, even if they aren't with the same pack forever. So when this is the case for wolves in film and television, they're usually major antagonists. Oh, I can do whatever I want. 
On the surface, you probably wouldn't think any of this if I mentioned Jimmy and Portia Crystal from Sing 2. The extent to which the animals impact the original movie's plot is very limited outside of, I guess, the visual juxtaposition of the biggest animal having the least confidence and the smallest one being the most arrogant. And I'm not going to act like this is an issue that's dramatically rectified in the sequel or anything, but I do think some of the narrative tropes mentioned here can be applied to them, mainly Jimmy Crystal. Because he's not some rando antagonist, he's a business executive, he's in a position of power over those around him. Symbolically, he fits the role of an alpha wolf, but his priorities lie with exerting control and maintaining that power, making him unable to connect with the people who make him as successful as he is. It's meant to mirror the way CEOs frequently act in real life, both in the entertainment world and other industries, and that is my defense for Buster Moon lying to get his way in this movie. He's lying to a gatekeeping CEO with anger issues, and those people are always in the wrong. It's part of what makes him being a wolf contain an element of symbolism. The character that starts out on top, and the one that the other characters are most intimidated by because of his aggression and position of power. His hunt is something he does in isolation because of how small and limited his social circle is in terms of the characters who have a mutual level of camaraderie with him. By the time we get to the end, though, that's what leads to his downfall. To clarify, I'm not saying this is the most nuanced and intricate storytelling in all of fiction, but I do view it as showing some level of care in the story having anthropomorphic animals as its characters. And since this is the part where I lose about half of the people still watching for saying something nice about this movie, it's time to talk about someone everybody likes to keep that equilibrium. I'm death. Straight. Up. Personifying Puss's fear of death in the form of a wolf is fascinating to me for a lot of reasons. The exploration and creative takes on iconic fairy tale characters is embedded in the DNA of every film in the Shrek universe. But while death isn't a concept that was foreign to iconic literature from this genre, it rarely takes on a sentient form. So even though the writer's decision to make him into a character had to be done in a way that made him fit within the universe, there was a lot of creative liberty with what they could do when conceiving him. Humans live alongside the fantastical creatures in this universe, he didn't have to be a wolf. Why did DreamWorks decide to do this other than scaring kids? I think this movie embracing its identity as a more serious reimagining of fairy tales is one key factor to why this version of Death is the species that he is. Wolves were very frequently villains in a lot of recognizable ones like Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Little Pigs, Peter and the Wolf, and The Boy Who Cried Wolf. And we could go into how this was a byproduct of the time period they were written in, that being the entire basis for Wolf Walker's plot, but that's a whole nother can of worms. Returning to death, this makes them fit in very well with the setting, and feels like it's paying homage to what pioneered this genre of storytelling. As much as we like the Shrek franchise for its subversions and edginess, we wouldn't have had any of it without these timeless stories as a frame of reference. We can use the movie's plot as a good launching point to further answer that question. All the major characters are hunting for a wishing star to get that last wish. So death initially presents himself as a bounty hunter, who's known for their persistence in traveling long distances when it comes to hunting. I've been following you for a long time. Also, it turns out that wolves do in fact have a heightened sense of smell compared to other predators as a form of communication through chemicals, which does allow them to sometimes detect emotions. I just love the smell of fear. And the heightened aggression coming as a result of hunting on his own. I mean, as my boss pointed out a while back, what defines him as a villain, rather than just an antagonistic force, is his relentless desire to prematurely cut Puss's last life short. The isolated wolf setup for death is something that makes his motivations as interesting as they are. Not only is he on his own, but there's also no form of escape for him as an immortal force of nature. You can infer that his disdain for Puss not valuing any of his previous lives because of how many he's had can come from seeing death in various circumstances across time. It serves as a buffer to his natural order and what he uses as justification for him to step outside his role being understandably enthusiastic about it. But from an outsider's perspective, he still sees the value of connection while living, even when death is inevitable, making his decision to let Puss go for the time being have a much more neutral outlook on death as a concept. It's not something he considers to be a weakness, and Puss realizing that is what makes him decide to live his life as intended. Man, all this talk about death, though, has me imagining how he must have felt having to wait for King Harold to die in Shrek the Third. But the apotheosis of the independent wolf didn't come with death, in my opinion. Because you guys want to know who my favorite character in the bad guys is? You're afraid. 
because I'm the, the big bad wolf. I mean, it's not Mr. Wolf, but we're gonna talk about him. There's unrestrained creativity with the bad guys as an anthropomorphic animal movie because it showcases what the repercussions of the dynamics and attitude towards wild animals would be if they lived amongst us as equals. When it comes to how we interact with the wild, the general populace tends to have certain presumptions and confirmation biases about aesthetically scary creatures that aren't beloved like most pets. I saw this video on Twitter a few days ago of this guy chasing crocodiles trying to hit them with a shovel and all I could think about in that moment was how many more people would call this sort of thing out if they were cute animals? Some parts of snakes, wolf, sharks, etc. are dangerous, yes, but that doesn't mean they're unlovable, nor should that be used as justification to mistreat them on principle. Mr. Wolf's introduction is literally him talking about how he's the villain in every story. This is by no means the first movie to deal with the concept of judging people by appearances, but it is enhanced by them being animals a lot. Wolf Wolf doesn't have an internal conflict of if he wants to be accepted though. His conflict comes from if he's able to be open about those wants to the only friends he's ever had. He figures out early on that he wants being good to be more than just an aesthetic for them. And what makes this a believable source of tension is that the other's internalization of the belief they shouldn't aspire to be anything other than criminals is that their isolation from society is what brought them together. The dispersion of an entire wolf pack usually happens if one of the alphas die because of how reliant they are on them for guidance and keeping the team together. That's what happens once Marmalade is revealed to be the antagonist. Weaponizing Wolf's optimism about the world and using his framing of the team for stealing the thick AF meteorite discourages Wolf from the idea that he'll be accepted and strains the relationship with the rest of his friends. It's why he's dissatisfied when he escapes prison with Diane. He has a chance to prove himself a hero to the rest of the world and get the girl, but at what cost? Even when given a second opportunity to return the meteorite after the others come to terms with their ability to do good, he's willing to sacrifice his goodwill in the public eye if it means getting Snake to rejoin the team, revealing that social acceptance is rendered irrelevant to him if it means personal improvement as an individual and helping each other become better. A wolf never abandons his pack, and looking out for each other is what matters the most in the grand scheme of things. It's okay that they ended up going to jail, they've still got each other, and they pulled off a heist even bigger than they could have imagined. See? <laughs> there are non-shark related reasons why I like this movie. The mark of a good anthropomorphic animal movie is what the characters being animals means for the story. And that doesn't even have to be in the form of verbal acknowledgement. It can be symbolism, humor, physicality. And when looking at all the characters I talked about, the commonality that makes them embody the concept so well is everything from their interactions, their values, their struggles, their flaws, and arcs in some cases, are all not only well written, but things that can imagine being a part of wolves' lives if they move through the world like us. And that's the best way to make for a worthwhile and memorable execution of the concept, where there's something there for everyone to connect to. You know what, all this talk about wolves kind of makes me take back what I said earlier in the video. Maybe if the right Animal Crossing wolf villager comes along on a villager hunt like Sky or Whitney, they can be international ambassadors in the <laughs> state.